fried food with a center page article in the Daily Telegraph in which he said that genetically engineered crops reduced consumer choice and threatened the environment. One of the leading companies in the field, Monsanto, which started a big publicity drive for so-called GM food at the weekend, says the new crops are better and will cut the use of pesticides. Prince Charles is Britain's most famous organic farmer. He doesn't use chemicals to kill insects or weeds. Now he's on the offensive over genetically modified crops. He said it before and today he says it again, this time in an article in the Daily Telegraph. He says putting genes from one species into another, with which it could never naturally breed, raises crucial ethical and practical questions. He goes on, this kind of genetic modification takes mankind into realms that belong to God and God alone. We live in an age of rights. It seems to me that it's time our creator had some rights too. Prince Charles's views are not shared by the industry which makes the crops. In Norwich, they're producing tomatoes genetically manipulated to resist disease. They deny they represent a risk to the public. I'm a consumer too. My family will be eating transgenic plant products and uh, I have absolutely no qualms about it. I mean, I think it's completely safe. I can assure you, if I thought it was dangerous, I would be making uh, sure that everybody knew about it. In Britain, there are two main genes transferred to plants in experiments. One makes plants resistant to insects. The plant makes a chemical which kills the insect. The second gene makes the crop resistant to weed killers. Farmers growing the crop can spray a chemical which kills everything except the crop. There are several dozen experiments underway which have been approved by the government's advisory committee. The committee believes the experiments are safe and genetic modification has environmental benefits. I think it will allow better targeting of agrochemicals and it will allow us to perhaps move away from some of the uh, agrochemicals that are used at the moment which have quite persistent effects on the environment. But despite the reassurances, there's evidence the public is worried. The BSE crisis, which led to a new form of CJD in humans, has helped fuel anxiety over modern farming methods. While America has made wide use of genetically engineered crops, Britain is more reserved. People really want to know very precisely about where their products have come from. In the States, they have the Food and Drug Administration, which approves products, and so they don't have that kind of issue over there. In the face of growing concern, the industry is fighting back. Over the weekend, advertisements appeared in the papers proclaiming the benefits of genetic crops. With Prince Charles spearheading the concern, though, the industry has a tough battle on its hands. James Wilkinson, BBC News. And I'm joined now from our Westminster studio by Patrick Holden from the Soil Association and from Central London by Dr Colin Merritt from Monsanto. Dr Merritt, is the lesson of the BSE affair not that one must be extremely careful about messing about with nature? Well, I think everything that we do in science and technology has to be carefully controlled. And this area is probably more carefully controlled than anything's ever been before. Uh, I'm absolutely confident that our government regulations and expert committees are very solid on this. You have no doubt at all. I mean, that's the sort of thing people said about, uh, about cattle feed before BSE came to, to, to light. You're absolutely confident in saying that there are no unforeseen consequences of this genetically modified crop. Yes, I think this is one of the, if not the, most heavily regulated and carefully controlled developments we've ever had. Um, it's very dangerous to compare it with things like animal diseases, as has been often done by our opponents in, in this technology. Um, but I'm absolutely confident that those crops that have been approved have been very thoroughly reviewed by the government and by scientists. Patrick Holden, do you accept that? No, I certainly don't. The government committee that has been licensing the trial plots of genetic engineering has so far approved every single one of the applications. And the fact well, is... Well, that, that could just mean they're all safe, couldn't it? Uh, no, I don't think it does. The fact is that this technology is hit and miss. It's a random sort of process. It consists of transplanting the DNA from one species into another and the long-term unpredictable consequences both to the environmental the environment and human health simply can't be known and we should learn the lessons from BSC and not take the risk. Dr Merritt, it is frightening, isn't it, that you're not doing something that nature would normally do. You're not mi mi mixing within the same species. You are, as, uh, as uh, um, Patrick Holden says, you're taking things from one species into another. Well, almost all of our crops today were originally grown through crossbreeding and hybridization from other species. As we, all we're doing now is we have developed our science so that we actually understand what's happening even at the molecular level. We've never known before um, the detail and the precise nature of crossbreeds that we've had. Patrick Holden, would you not accept that there can actually be some environmental 
benefits from genetically modified crops? Unfortunately not. The agenda of Monsanto and the other half a dozen multinational pesticide companies is to and encourage the widespread use of genetically engineered crops, so much so that within a decade we may even find that almost all the staple food commodities throughout the planet are genetically engineered. Now the consequences of that to the environment will be devastating because most of them will have uh, genetic resistance to herbicides which will mean that the Monsanto companies of this world will sell the farmers the seed and then back it up with the herbicide with devastating consequences to the environment. Dr. Merritt, a quick word finally from you because that was a direct ac accusation. Well, this is pure scaremongering based on no fact and of course farmers will still have the choice not to use these products if, if it's not economically of benefit to them to do so. All right, we must leave it there. Thanks very much to both of you. Thank you. Europe has stepped up the pressure on Serbia to end its military offensive against ethnic Albanians in Kosovo. European Union foreign ministers meeting in Luxembourg have agreed to ban all new investment in Serbia and freeze the country's assets abroad. Speaking before the decision, the Foreign Secretary, Robin Cook, said Serbia had to be sent a strong message. The modern Europe will not tolerate the full might of army power being used against civilian centers of population. That's why today I expect us to ban all investment within Serbia. And I also hope to support the step Britain's taking to get the measures within the United Nations and NATO agreed to stop the violence in Kosovo. Well, a short while ago, I spoke to our correspondent in Luxembourg, David Eads, and I asked him if anyone believed sanctions alone would resolve the crisis. No, and I don't think the foreign ministers here think that either. The German foreign minister, Klaus Kinkel, spelt it out a few moments ago that sanctions alone uh, will not suffice. And what the ministers are keen to do here is try and keep the momentum rolling, really, for NATO in particular to look at contingency plans, possibly for getting troops down onto the Albanian border, possibly for some sort of intervention in Kosovo itself. You can really see the possibility of NATO troops going into Kosovo, can you? Because that would be a huge step, wouldn't it? Yes, that would be a huge step, and I think that would probably at this stage be a step too far. Again, Mr. Kinkle made that clear that getting the Russians on board for such an idea uh, seemed out of the question, certainly at the moment. I think the point that the foreign ministers are trying to make is that all options are being kept open. At least NATO planners are looking at these things now, which in itself is a, a, a step well ahead of perhaps the, uh, if you want to make any comparison to Bosnia, and that's what the foreign ministers keep doing here. They're saying Kosovo must not be another Bosnia. At least they feel that they're being seen to do the right thing. And is there an assumption that at some stage the United Nations would have to be involved? Yes, very much so. And the push here uh, is for some sort of UN mandate, ultimately, uh, to at least give the opportunity for uh, a military presence to, to take matters into their own hands, should that be the case. But once again here, the top-line message really is that uh, there should be an immediate cessation to the violence here with further measures to come if that doesn't happen. Uh, as we look at it at the moment, that very well might happen. The point is, will the violence stop for good? And that seems far less certain. David, thanks very much indeed. The future of fishing with drift nets, which are thought to kill thousands of dolphins each year, is being considered by the European Union. The nets, which are used to catch tuna and swordfish, have been labelled walls of death by environmentalists because of the number of creatures that get caught up in them. Britain is calling for a ban, but there's strong opposition from France and the Irish Republic. These are the so-called walls of death. Drift nets many miles long, used to catch tuna and swordfish, but also inadvertently killing thousands of dolphins, whales and sharks every year. Tuna's a lucrative business, sales to the Japanese are huge, and that's encouraged the French and Italians regularly to violate the existing ban on nets more than two and a half kilometres long. Today's decision is expected to ban drift net fishing by EU boats in the Mediterranean from early next century. I would like to see an agreement to phase out uh, uh, tuna fishing with drift nets because of the uh, side effects on dolphins and cetaceans. And we've been working for that for some time, but of course it's, uh, it's dependent on other members of the council as it is on the UK. But the UK will certainly be voting for that. Britain wants today's ministerial meeting to agree to a ban from as early as January 2000, but the French and the Irish have been pushing for a much later start date. They're also unhappy about the cash being made available for retraining. Outside the ministers' meeting, a Greenpeace demonstration in support of the drift net ban provoked an angry response from a group of Irish fishermen. Hey, hey come on, we are peaceful. We are... They said drift net fishing was worth four million pounds a year to their rural communities. They weren't responsible, they said, for killing dolphins. 
The people who give us the bad name are people who are using miles and miles of driftnet. We don't do that. We have only small vessels with, with short gear. And it's nonsense for these people to say that we're using walls of death. The ban is good news for dolphins, but not if they venture into the Baltic Sea where the regulations won't apply. And campaigners don't underestimate the ingenuity of fishermen in the Mediterranean to find loopholes to get around the ban. Angus Roxburgh, BBC News, Luxembourg. The government faces a rebellion in the Commons tonight when the House votes on the introduction of university tuition fees. More than 30 Labour backbenchers are said to be opposed to plans to introduce fees for higher education and the replacement of maintenance grants with student loans. These students from the London School of Economics scraped in under the wire. This September's intake will be liable for tuition fees of £1,000 a year and their grants will be replaced by loans. It's becoming for those who can afford it, not those who are academically worthy of it, which is wrong. It's for the whole purpose of education. If I'd had fees, then I would have just had to go to work instead of having an education. I believe that higher education funding really is in a mess nowadays. We do need a hell of a lot more money and I don't see the government's ever going to provide that, so I think fees may be the only answer. The plans have provoked a series of demonstrations and two rebellions are expected in the Commons later tonight over fees and loans. For some on the left of the party, it's a question of principle. For those of us who had our own free education, and that's virtually everybody on the Labour benches, it's a matter of principle. We shouldn't be pulling the ladder up and denying others what we took as our right. The Education Secretary, David Blunkett, at a school for disabled pupils in Trafford today, confirmed a package of measures to help mature students, single parents and disabled people, but denied this was a concession to the rebels. And I think those who are criticising us don't understand the programme. Uh, this actually provides access to those who wouldn't have it. It provides quality by reinforcing, through investment in higher education, opportunity that wouldn't exist. And it asks people to make a contribution, not now when they're... Uh, at their lowest income level, but in future when they're at their maximum prosperity. The rebels are claiming the support of more than 30 Labour MPs, though government sources predict no more than 10 or 12 will actually vote against its plans. It's still embarrassing for a government that prides itself on keeping the party marching in coordinated step. Carol Walker, BBC News, Westminster.